Hello and welcome to Dungeons and Drama Nerds. My name is Nick Orvis, and today I'm joined by Percy. Hello. And Todd. Hey there. Today we wanted to talk about the divide between mainstream and indie in theater and tabletop role-playing games. Thinking about this from a tabletop perspective, we kind of wanted to frame the season starting with a very quote-unquote mainstream entry, Dungeons & Dragons, published by Wizards of the Coast, followed by an indie darling, which is Apocalypse World, published by Lumpley Games. In a broad strokes view, it's easy to think of mainstream publishers as slow-moving, profit-driven, and generally more conservative in content or geared towards broader appeal. In contrast, we often think of indie developers in opposition to the mainstream. They are quick, they're art forward, and they tend to be more progressive. Today, we wanted to have a discussion really examining these ideas and what indie actually means. And then on the flip side with theater, we have similar feelings about indie theater versus large um, nonprofit or for-profit theater, uh, whichever, like if we're talking the public or like Broadway, um, many smaller theaters are able to be nimble, reactive and of the moment, while larger organizations tend to be planned out a year or so in advance, if not even further. Um it's also important to recognize how we're using indie in this sense. Like, are we talking Broadway versus nonprofit? Are we talking Broadway versus off Broadway versus off off Broadway, which is largely like semantics about house size? Um, there's a lot of different ways to look at this and to cut this cake. Is that a metaphor? I don't know. Yeah, it's a it's a large cake to be cut. So for me, indie comes for obviously comes from independent. And I, I do think of it as being that kind of idea of uh, being creatives who work outside of sort of institutions, um, whether that be, uh, you know, in the theater world, like Todd said, the big nonprofits or kind of Broadway producers, which doesn't necessarily mean that they can't be, uh, you know, that indie producers can't make money or be profitable it just means that they're sort of not ensconced in that uh procedure procedure bound kind of uh like structure lort, like a lort or in yeah like a lort or any TCG. kind of big not-for-profit basically in the theater world again if you have like a, a board and regular funders you are probably not indie in my in my mind um I actually want to trouble that a little bit only because yeah. I think I mean, I think I think in order to have a company, because I would there are companies I would consider like indie companies, but the structure of a nonprofit is like a board, although perhaps the board of an indie company is like two people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's definitely um, uh, something that complicates this is that like in order to incorporate to be a 501c3 nonprofit, you need to have a board, but your board can be your two friends. Um, and doesn't need to be like a set of financial advisors who regularly donate large swaths of money to keep the institution afloat, um, which is more what you're talking about, I think. Nick. Yeah. Is it a question of like, is it budget size? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I kind of want to say it's not budget size. But then again, I also can't think of any indie creators who work on like a super high budget <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. well, I think the problem that we're running into is that there isn't a de there isn't actually a definition of what indie means. It only is like not Broadway or like not regional theater. Um, like I think it's an aesthetic that we've all collectively just like agreed upon. Um, but there's not really like we're defining the word indie in opposition to the mainstream, as opposed to actually saying like this is what this means. Yeah, and I mean, thinking about the the world of tabletop role playing games, there are certainly a lot of. I think I think my impression is very similar to theater. Just like there's you know Wizards of the Coast and Paizo and Green Ronin and those that kind of like handful of uh, kind of old school tabletop companies. There are a lot of quote unquote tabletop companies that are like two people who write games together, and like that is the company, and it doesn't have any regularly salaried employees or anything like that but that those people i would consider kind of falling into the indie sphere usually mm -hmm. even if they have a quote-unquote company that has a brand and a recognizable name and so on i do think it's easier in tabletop to be a quote-unquote independent creator only because like tabletop games are a thing that you can make by yourself right um, and there are many many people who make their living selling their content on drive-thru rpg or on itch.io 
Um, and they are very much like one person games companies functionally who, who just like are themselves and make content. Um, but that's not really possible to do <laughs> in the theater. You do need at least two people probably. Yeah. I wonder if, and this is maybe getting at, at something different, but I, I often think of the indie scene as it's not quite the same as, but I also don't think it's disconnected from the idea of the avant-garde. And in some ways, I actually think that's more true of tabletop games than theater, because my feeling of the scene is that, well, in theater, you have all sorts of indie creators, including people who, you know, for example, are early career artists who are just like, I have written this play and I want to put it up with my friend directing it and whatever, but aren't necessarily, um, you know, aren't necessarily positioning themselves in opposition to the the like major producers i feel like the tabletop world is much more i've seen a lot more of that kind of oppositional relationship Mm -hmm. in tabletop where indie creators not all by any means but i feel like there's a bigger swath of indie creators who are kind of like you know not necessarily like i hate x but it's but it's like i i have seen what like the Dungeons and Dragons is, and I want to create something that is like swinging hard in the other direction. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think in some ways because Wizards of the Coast is very monolithic in mm-hmm. the field, um, whereas like the closest you could say is like Broadway versus everything else. Like maybe. And like Broadway isn't. I mean, there's like a number of Broadway producers and they have similar aesthetics by and large, but like it's not the singular Broadway aesthetic versus everything else in the theater the way we tend to think of it. But if you're thinking of like the Broadway musical versus like literally any other theatrical form, that's maybe a closer approximation of what you're talking about. Well, and I think part of it is also that there's there is a quote unquote indie aesthetic in role playing games that I don't think you necessarily find exactly as clear cut in, in theater. Like I think there are definitely trends in what I would consider indie theater in terms of ways that they play with form or ways that like types of performances that they tend to do in indie companies or with indie producers. Um, But I think at tabletop games, you could like, functionally define an indie game as like a narratively focused game that is rules light yeah that would be my that would be my definition and there's certainly like indie games that that don't do that but um if you're looking at like actual whole entire games that people have created those are definitely two big trends yeah i wonder if in some ways the the rules of tabletop games actually make it easier to see those kind of patterns and those differences because you know and any given theater creator is going to be drawing on you know a whole mix of theater history and what they've seen and what they like and what they don't like um in a way that ends up being very like blended and inextricable whereas you know if you if you make a powered by the apocalypse game you know you generally you can see that like if you know what you're looking at you can see that in a more direct way then you know you can trace a playwright's influences just by watching their play although actually now that i now that i'm thinking about it you actually can see the same phenomenon in theater it's just not as easy to see like you just said because like i'm thinking about what rules light means in terms of theater and i'm actually thinking it's i think in theater there is a reaction to like what we are quote-unquote supposed to produce or what is quote-unquote producible um Mm. Because almost every indie company that I'm aware of rejects plays with couches in them, rejects living room plays, um, dabbles in site specific work or dabbles in immersive work, like dabbles with things that break the rules of like fourth wall, proscenium, theater, um, realism, naturalism. Like I think you see very much a reaction against the dominant aesthetic um, that we see in regional theaters and on Broadway in indie theater in the same way that like. I understand narratively focused games like Powered by the Apocalypse games to be a reaction against super crunchy, mechanics heavy games like Pathfinder and Dungeons Mm -hmm. and Dragons. Well, and I also um, 
a thought that I asked a number of my like directing peers when I used to work in New York was like how many of us have like a minimalist poor theater aesthetic and how many of us do that because it's what we can afford. How many of us have built a set out of trash? (laughs) Yeah. And also like the rejection of living room and couch plays um, is easy if you decide that like couches are too expensive and too hard to move in and out of a space if you're producing in a space that you do not own. And that space is a basement with 30 seats in it. Exactly. Hi, or under St. Mark's. We love you. Under St. Mark's, I love you so much. <laughs> or it's on the 12th floor. Hi, the crane. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, both space, spaces that I have produced in a bit, um, alongside Nick. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking about uh, Shetler Studios. It's my yeah. indie. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but RIP. I think that, like, as a result, you do have this, like, modernist because we're not going to pay for fancy costumes it's going to be um contemporary it's not going to be a period piece generally um we're not going to have a lot of sets um if we need to indicate sets we'll do it in an imaginative way for example people are going to sit on blocks and then someone's going to hold up a cut out of a train and we're going to pretend we're on a train like those are things um that indie producers will use as workarounds um, instead of a fully produced, you know, $10 million Broadway version of what a scene might look like. Um, and so I think you can see those things in a, an oppositional way. In that vein, I'm going to ask a hot take question, a spicy question. Um, is indie work inherently more artistically daring or more artistically good? I mean, I think quality is like not... I've seen some of the best shows and some of the worst shows in like tiny basements. Um, (laughs) So I don't think that it's an inherent um, indicator of goodness. Well, the the question comes only because I think there is a perception of like, at least among artists, I think there is a perception of like regional theater is bad and like Broadway isn't good art. Um, Thinking like really critically about like actually like what does art mean? Um, and what is the artistic value of the work that you're doing beyond like the money that it makes you or the, how many tourists you attract to your play or whatever. Um, but, and I think I see, you see this in the tabletop community as well. People who are really, really invested in the artistry of this craft who absolutely seem to value the craft of like quote unquote indie TTRPGs a lot more highly than the craft of D and D to the extent that you'll see, creators like very publicly make a jump from like producing D and D supplements for drive through RPG to designing their own games. And it is like a huge deal because there is inherently more value assigned to the indie sphere than like Pathfinder and D and D content within the indie world. Yes. I think it's the, worth yes saying. That's a very <laughs> important distinction to make. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. As the literary manager of a regional theater, Um, which I think this is a fair question to ask. Um, I think that there's also a number of misconceptions about like what makes one in, like if we were just to like refocus this, if Portland stage, the theater that I work at were in downtown New York, we would be an off Broadway theater. Um, yeah. When I say regionals, I'm definitely thinking about the regional theater that I used to work for, which is Arena Stage, which is much, much different in yeah. aesthetic and budget and producing power than mm-hmm. Portland Stage. Totally. Yeah. Um, and I think we lump like the whole Lord thing together. And I also think that's fair. Um, I was having a conversation with my roommate today about how... Uh, an organization that is very large in Portland um, was part of this national convening and described themselves as a very small presenting house, which like on the national scale, they are. But in Portland, they are like the biggest roadhouse in the state, if not northern New England, like north of Boston. Mm -hmm. And so from our perspective, it's like, no, they're the big guys who have all the money. Um, And I think many people who are in Portland feel that way about Portland stage um, because we are relatively like we are not the indie theater of Maine um, in any way, shape or form. Uh, But if you put us in a different context, which I just think is like 
weird and interesting. I think that sparks for me that is interesting, I think, is actually that theater is like geographically anchored that way or has been because until very recently, it was all about putting people in tight, poorly ventilated rooms together. (laughs) Um, uh, (laughs) But but uh, tabletop games, game creation is not. Um, I mean, yes, there are co- like Wizards of the Coast and all those other like bigger publishers do have physical offices, but most creators are just, you know, interacting with each other on the Internet and spread out all across the country and the globe. Um, yeah. And, and do- to consume your tabletop game that you created, Nick, I don't have to live in your town. Right. Yeah, and I do wonder how that changes things. I, I I think one way it does is actually in terms of money, um, because I have seen conversations online among indie tabletop game designers that are about, you know, they're about fair compensation and so on. But also when you're working in a global context like that, you know, do you pay uh, everybody based on American like set the, like what your living standard is do you do that if you live in uh rural oklahoma in the united states do you do that if you live in new york city um you know and and then for, on the other side of that do people do people living in like malaysia want to set that as a standard of pay for themselves when that might mean that like if they budget for themselves to make that much money on all their projects that might preclude them working with people in their own like geographic orbit so Mm -hmm. i don't know that's a like interesting and complicated series of questions i've seen people wrestle with in a way that theater does like address those questions but not in quite the same well because i think in theater (laughs) you have the you have the kind of elephant of New York City in the in the room. If you're thinking mm-hmm. about the way that theater is tied geographically, we have this whole big problem with like assuming that the most innovative art is coming from New York, which is simply not true. Like there's certainly lots of innovative art coming from New York, but it's also coming from Washington, D.C. and many other cities. I <laughs> Well, I mean, which there's a lot of places. For a while, the way that you innovated on Broadway is you did an out of town tryout. You like tested your show in a different market, be that Chicago or Boston or somewhere else, and then you brought it to New York after you had like worked out the kinks of a first production. Yeah, and as much as we have regional theaters because there is a reaction against the idea that like New York mm-hmm. is the place where everything ends up and is like your end goal. We kind of still have that issue where like regional flipped, theaters yeah. are considered, yeah, are like, yeah, reg- regional theaters are creating content that eventually is supposed to go to New York, but the innovation is happening in other cities like Chicago and San Francisco and Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. Well, to some extent, I think Todd can confirm this, but I, I think also a lot of things, the pipeline kind of goes both ways because for a lot of regional theaters, a big barometer of what they're going to produce is what's been successful in New York. See in the, the last, flood of like, productions of Indecent <laughs> and the Wolves. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and there's this like the regional theater movement, which I guess we could have thought of as an indie theater movement originally indie in terms of oppositional um, in the 1960s was about decentering New York, decentering Broadway, saying that like this does not speak to the American theatrical experience. And so we're going to make theater for our regions. And then the things that were going from this regional theater movement into the Broadway pipeline um, became like a much more varied and diverse thing. And then, I mean, I think this comes like after like the late 80s, early 90s, as the economy shifted, um, suddenly regional theaters are exporting theater from New York as opposed to sending it to, or sorry, we're importing from New York instead of exporting to New York. Um, And I think that's really fascinating in terms of like the ethos is that it's now bringing Broadway to you, lowly regional person who does not live in New York and cannot go there all the time um, as opposed to making like theater by for and about the region um, and really embracing that 
Yeah, like I, th- I think our understanding of indie in the theater sphere is so impacted by work that's happening in New York, mm-hmm. which is kind of a problem in my opinion. Um, cause my ideal would be theater by four and about the people that you live in a community with. Totally. Um, I mean, I think part of the problem, and this is actually a problem that I'm looking at at Portland stage right now in ter- I'm like going through a bunch of data from the last 10 years of sales. <laughs> um, but I think part of the problem is that there's this need for, for like regional producing theaters that are producing constantly like the regional theater model i think is broken in a number of ways because it relies on you know having exploiting your workers (laughs) exploiting your workers um for sure i mean that was my hot take finish it at other places (laughs) finish your thought Um, (laughs) but like it relies on this assumption that you're going to bring in somewhere between like $300,000 300000 and 500000 a year in single ticket sales, mm-hmm. regardless of what you're producing. And in order to actually do that, you need to do things that are going to be like broad appeal enough and known enough that your audiences are going to show up for it. But not just your audiences, like people who aren't subscribers yet. Um, and so that limits risk, that limits mobility. Um, and that changes what you're willing to do. And so like, do you invest in a new play by a playwright from your region that might flop? Or do you pick up a show that has like a proven track record in New York that might do all right? And that has name recognition. Yeah, That you exactly. know, people in your area will have read the reviews of if they follow theater in the New York Times or whatever and be like, oh, I want to see that. I think all three of us have definitely been in literary offices and experienced the like frantic emails of like, oh, here's this Jeremy O'Hara's play that everybody's reading or like, oh, here's every other example that just flew out of my brain. But you've you've gotten the emails where ever like all the literary managers are reading um, slave play. Yeah. And I think that part of this, like part of the problem is that theater specifically plays, I think this is less true for musicals, but specifically plays, there isn't a way for people to know what the play is um, unless there's like high name recognition ahead of time. Whereas like even on Itch, uh, you can like preview Mm -hmm. a game Mm -hmm. and like read a little bit of it and see if it's the sort of thing that you want to invest $5 in, which is a low bar of entry, um, as opposed to like, here's a play we've never heard of. Do you want to spend $40 a piece on it? Yeah, I think, I think there's definitely a financial sort of privilege factor inherent in this because I think Indies by necessity, because they don't have any money, do, do work that is more cheap and can take more risks because they aren't risking financially on it as much as a regional theater is depending on ticket sale income. But I think there's also like, kind of a like like a lot of indie theaters don't pay the people who do art with them Mm -hmm. um i've Mm -hmm. done way too many shows for a percentage of ticket sales yeah (laughs) yeah and i think that is kind of the the trade-off one one of these questions on our on our little outline was like are indie companies in tabletop or theater inherently more progressive which is i i think uh, weirdly a perception that is widespread um i think it's because we've become so aware of institutions and of institutional power and privilege and hierarchy all of which is very important i don't want to to downplay that but i think there there is this kind of perception that like oh well like the folks doing theater and the in the basement there you know the the salt of the earth the bootstrappy artists who are like you know surely on the vanguard of like social and artistic and cultural change and it's like sometimes true and sometimes it's just people who want to make theater and don't have access to because well, the, the flip side capital. is that if you if you don't have a lot of money and you don't have a big board that oversees what you're doing, you can kind of get away with whatever you want provided that you can convince people to work with you. So that I think a lot of people get away with a lot of really terrible things, but because they are seen as like this countercultural progressive, um, scrappy 
organization that does daring, exciting work, like nobody cares. And I'm going to go ahead and name the elephant in the room, <laughs> which is the flea. Um, the recently like, think, shuttered flea. The well, recent, not shuttered. Well, Temporarily this, shuttered. There's a whole lot of stuff that's happened with the flea at the time that we're recording this. <laughs> More stuff um, will have happened by the time, probably by the time we're done recording it, let alone by the time the episode releases. But I mean, I think because this is a thing that like, when I, um, a couple years ago, I was working in Northern New Jersey in New York and there were tons of people who made jokes about like, oh, like get a bat to do it. Like it's a thing that has been a joke for a really long time. This group of people that are not paid for their labor and taken advantage of by this company. And like the, the industry just kind of like, didn't really take it seriously as these group of people was being exploited. I don't, I mean, I don't, I think, mm. I think it's something that everybody knew and something that people just didn't care about. Like people were still willing to spend money there. Well, yeah, I guess that's what I mean when um, I say they didn't take it seriously. Cause like, I would argue that equity is like, this is some nonsense, <laughs> but also I mean, yes. <laughs> equity was willing to extend them contracts for like small equity. I, mean, only I, shows I, worked that with they a, I worked with the director who at the time that I was working with him was also directing a show with the bats. Um, mm. And he was like, made a lot of jokes about how they weren't getting paid. And I was like, hmm, that's <laughs> interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, but I think people view indie work as like an opportunity to do artistically daring and exciting work. And it's also, they think they view it as a springboard um, to work that pays more. But also there's a lot of privilege embedded in that of like who can afford to to be a bat, who can afford to work for free. And I... I also feel like I would be remiss as someone who is friends with a number of former bats. Like I once had a conversation outside cereals with one of the bats and I, I just moved to New York. I was working for very little money on a very different show, but it was like paying my rent. Um, and I was like, I don't understand how you could do this. Like, I don't understand how you can work for free here. Um, and the reasoning that I got in return was that like, by being a bat, uh, this person had access to shows, like was able to be in shows that would be reviewed in the New York Times. Um, they could work with like cool directors, like I don't know, Joel Shoemaker isn't directing at the Crane. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you that. Um, and so, like in theory, was getting industry contacts. In theory, was like doing all of these like cool and daring pieces. And to this person, that was worth not getting paid because the amount of money that they would like pay to produce their own work that wouldn't get reviewed and like blah, 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 blah. Well, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here to judge anybody who has been about just to be clear. If you've done Um, that, that's totally cool. Yeah. It's, I mean, I think similarly, I, when I was working in Northern New Jersey and astute listeners will begin to put together how this podcast happened. Um, uh, but when I was working at a different theater there, um, a college student asked me for some mentorship and they were, you know, living, they lived in the area and were like, oh, I'm thinking of applying to this uh, fellowship at Playwrights Horizons, which at the time I think paid like 200 bucks a week. It pays a metro, it paid a metro card. Mm. The cost, it covered the cost of a metro card and maybe a $75 a week stipend. Yeah, I was going to say there's so there was some actual cash amount. But regardless, my point is what I told her was, uh, you know, w- was basically I do not support fellowships or internships with that little compensation. However, if you're living with your parents and you're willing to, like, commute into the city every day and your parents are fine with you living there and you get this internship like do it it's a great opportunity um yeah. like both those things can be true because mm-hmm. we can't you know i i don't think that there's any i don't think that we can really accrue any blame to people working within this to to the people who are not being compensated for trying to you know work within this yeah. broken system no, where totally. i do put some blame is on you know the the original question is like are indie companies progressive to which I would say not necessarily because of things like this. And that's where I do put the blame is on like the companies. Oh, totally. Like the reason that I have a career with Portland stage company is because when I was in college, I put together a list of all of the Lorts that offered 
internships in the fields that I was interested in, which were directing and graphic design and dramaturgy. Um, and then I narrowed that list of like 60 theaters down to 12 that paid me enough that I could live. Um, and that's like of the 75 quote unquote professional theaters in the country that are running at a scale of $2 million a year or more, there's like 12 that offer fair compensation. And some of those are some of the smaller theaters, including Portland Stage. <laughs> like it's one of the few cost neutral internships that I know of where they cover your rent, they cover your utilities, and they give you a stipend for food. I was literally asked in my interview how I planned to survive on the stipend that the fellowship I was That's interviewing insane. for offered. That's insane. <laughs> Right? That shouldn't this be is, a question. But this yeah. is this is only I would not consider the institution that shall not be named. Um, but if you look at my Twitter, you'll figure out what it is. Um, I, they are they're not an indie theater by any stretch. So to sort of refocus, I think there is a question of privilege in terms of who has access to opportunities that don't pay them. And I think that is an important thing to recognize, even if you are in a place where you can accept those opportunities, because it does like create an equity in our field. And there's a similar conversation happening in tabletop. Um, there was like a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, a lot of conversation about whether it's okay to sell games that are not play tested. Um, and I don't know a ton about the process of hiring people to play test your game, but I would assume that there is some compensation expected. And it's, you know, a thing, a thing that requires money to invest in and also time. Um, because if you're making your living selling your supplements or your games on drive through RPG, you probably need to be posting things pretty consistently in order in order to actually generate income from it so there's there is this conversation that was essentially about um is kind of shading designers on itch who are like frequently like indie creators like small creators who are a you know a party party of one company of one making content and it was kind of the, yeah it was just this question about like is it okay to sell games without play testers but like the very real factor of that is like it requires a little bit of privilege it requires like money in order to have access to resources like that um and i think it's a question of like what barriers to entry are okay to have in your art form um because currently there's a barrier to entry in theater of either having the financial like having the family support or generational wealth or whatever to be able to work for free or like <laughs> to the ability to figure it out and not ever sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I will say, I think one of the, one of the sillier things about that tabletop discourse on play testing is that of course, nobody defined the terms, which I think is what led to a lot of the fracas because I, I do think, you know, when I've read that question, I did not read it as like, does a game need to have a large, play test um i i kind of took it as does a game need to have been like played maybe multiple times yes because if i like created a game i think i would i do not have the resources and frankly i would not care <laughs> because i'm not a professional to uh like hire a bunch of people to play test it but what i could do and i think they'd be open to it would be like would go would be to go to my D group and be like hey, I made this game. You want to try it out for a night? And I don't, I mean, I don't know, but I don't know that that is less of a... Yeah, I think that's perfectly fine test. to sell a game that you've like done that with. And it also depends a lot on your goals as a... Like, I, yeah, like, I feel like that's fine. But then it turned into this whole thing about, about privilege, but I think there is a lot of privilege inherent in doing art for a living, regardless of what the art is, whether you're making tabletop games or producing theater like, I think there's just a lot of privilege inherent in being able to do this as, as a way of earning income. Um, mm -hmm. Well, and I think um, flipping back a little to the like art for art's sake and the like nobility of being indie, I think there's this assumption that like to be doing something for money is inherently like dirty and less than and gross and bad because we live in a capitalist hellscape well that's because um, we don't understand making art to be labor sorry that's right. the biggest no, soapbox totally. that i have <laughs> totally 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 um but like 
so we assign virtue to people who they're not tainting their art with like ideas of being compensated and i'm i'm using like I'm not actually using air quotes right now, but if you can't hear the sarcasm dripping off of my voice, I'm very sorry. Um, But there's this idea (laughs) that like true artists like suffer for their work and suffer for their art and like blah, 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 blah. And like most of the large indie like artists, um, at least in theater, are like relatively independently wealthy and are able to like make cool, wild art because it doesn't matter if they will make money on it or not, because they will not be kicked out of their really bougie, beautiful apartments, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. And I I think think that's a choice that you can make when you're financially stable. Yeah. So it's, I think it all is. Yeah. Cause, cause ultimately like doing, doing art is something that should be accessible to everybody. No, it, it totally is. I get, I guess here's the weird, like catch. It's not catch 22. I don't know how to put it, but like, Doing art should be accessible to everybody. Full stop. Art should also be accessible to everybody. And artists should be compensated. But. Well, no, no, but. But (laughs) like the logical outcome of that, I think, is that like. (laughs) Well, there's a reality that not everybody will be able to make an income doing art. Like, that's that's fine. That's capitalism. Yeah. But well, well, yeah, which we can discuss whether that's fine. But like the the thing I'm like grappling toward and articulating very badly is like if you are selling a game or a show or whatever on a marketplace. And this was one of the things I was weirded out by on the itch discourse. I don't think it's an illegitimate question to ask, was this game or show or whatever done well enough to be worth my payment. Yeah. And I think that's the issue of like, that's, that's capitalism, baby. Like that's <laughs> well, like, cause in some ways, like, yeah, if I'm delivering an insufficient um, product, um, you will choose to buy it and then choose to never buy from me again. And that's how the market works. And I'll be forced out of the quote unquote free market um, eventually, because people will stop buying my lower quality goods, whether that's plays or games. But but it is not only a, you know, it's not only a free market problem, because if, say, I buy a hundred, if I buy a thousand games on itch and 990 of them are unplayable, and I, and I have bought games like that on itch before where I've like <laughs> read through them and been like, wait, there's this very obvious like rules interaction like thing X will happen if I play this game and there is no like explanation of what to do when that happens. But if if I buy a thousand games on itch and 990 of them are unplayable, I'm probably going to stop buying games on itch. And then that doesn't only hurt the individual. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, like switching from like it's a capitalist hellscape but also like you know la- that's why labor unions have standards mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. like that's labor unions that's part of their powers they say okay to be part of this you know we're going to negotiate for you and so on but also you have to be able to deliver a certain kind of like minimum quality because mm-hmm. if you repeatedly and continually fuck up then nobody is going to hire then like we lose our collective power well and i think this is butting up against the idea of like inherently assigning virtue to things that we perceive as outside of the mainstream purely because they are like not commercial in nature like i think when you're thinking about art there is this perception that anything that is not commercial or like not participating in capitalism or is in some way like not trying to be commercially successful is inherently good which is just not the case like, I think the whole thing is just that we are lying to ourselves about where artistic value comes from, because I think like financial success is an indicator of artistic value. Um, it's just that like there are millions of people on the planet who all want different things from the art that they consume. So some things are not for everybody. Like, I I don't know. This is this is like getting into a whole other thing that we I don't think have time to unpack. 
in this episode of this podcast. But like I do, I mean, I do firmly believe that even like for profit theater, like theater on Broadway, you can find artistic, some artistic merit in some aspect of everything that's on Broadway. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And like, while I do think a lot of those things are designed to be extremely broad appeal in one way, shape or form, that doesn't make them bad. Um, And I think there's a lot of people who feel that like opposite nature of that, like all commercial art must therefore be bad. And like, are there things that happen on Broadway that are terrible? Totally. Are the things that I think are the coolest that are on Broadway things that like made their way from off Broadway to Broadway? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 100%. Um, Well, but I think there are, I think audience is a, is a factor in this indie versus mainstream in what, in what those things are, are defined as, because I think there are audiences who specifically seek out things that are not mainstream mm -hmm. purely because they reject whatever they consider mainstream. Like, I think there are a lot of people who really pride themselves on being like downtown New York theater goers. Mm hmm. And and see that as making them like better than the person who has seen Wicked sixty times. <laughs> I mean, listen, if you've seen Wicked sixty times, you just have a lot more disposable income than I do. So <laughs> that's extremely fair. <laughs> um, but no, I was I was going to say the 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 thing is, of course, though that, and I, I get frustrated with this both in theater and in tabletop in some ways. Uh, is that like. Most of those people who pride themselves on being, uh, you know, downtown New York theater goers or whatever, um, started with Broadway mm -hmm. oh, or yeah. Arthur Miller or whatever, you know, like insert mainstream thing here. And and I think this, you know, I think there's a lot more people playing like obscure PBTA or GM lists or like No Dice, No Masters games <laughs> who started from Dungeons and Dragons in some iteration and then like dug their way into the scene, then there are people who just like somehow stumbled across a like weird journaling game on itch and were like, this is extremely my shit. I'm going to consume only indie tabletop role playing games for the rest of my life. Yeah. And like, I think that there's, there's a lot of flack that is given to the Tonys each year for like being Broadway's biggest night and like theater's biggest night. And there's a lot of people who are like, this isn't really what theater is. This isn't really what X is. But like, yeah, I started liking theater because I saw the Tony Awards as a kid who lived in a town that only had a community theater that I went to. But like. And I only I mostly as like Todd producer director guy, like I'm mostly interested in like weird fucking plays, but I would never have been introduced to any of that if I wasn't into very Broadway theater when I was younger. And I'm not saying that you like need to evolve past a need for broad. Like, no, that's bullshit. And that's but like it's classist a, it's an grossness. Entry point. It's, it's, it's an, an entry, entry point. For so many and people. it's the largest entry point for so many people. And it's useful. Like um, Hamilton got released this year on Disney Plus and a lot of like very jaded, very boring New York theater people were like, Ugh, I can't believe this is what people and like, I'm so excited for the art that like kids that are 16 and are seeing Hamilton in their homes as like their entry point to theater full stop are going to make as someone who like watched the Broadway recording of Into the Woods on a DVD that my friend had and thought that that was really cool. Like, I'm excited for the theater that those kids are going to make because that's so exciting. What a cool show to be your first show. Yeah, like in the scheme of things, my takeaway here is like this divide is not productive mm -hmm. or useful because there are so many different kinds of art and so many artistic aesthetics and so many reason to make reasons to produce plays and make games that we can all just coexist because mm -hmm. people's entry points will all be different, but everything serves a purpose in creating an ecosystem in which people are interested in the art that we're making, which ultimately is kind of the important thing is, is that people are getting into going to see theater or playing tabletop role playing games. It could and should be a healthy ecosystem. I don't 
I don't remember who this is. I wouldn't name them anyway, but I saw a weird tweet one time that was like attempting to dunk on one of the lead designers for Pathfinder because he tweeted out something about like how cool indie games are. And they're like, well, Pathfinder's not an indie game. And I was like, I don't think this guy, like, I would never in a million years assume this guy was like indie games like Pathfinder, <laughs> the large corporate entity I work for. Mm. Like, I assume that he likes indie games because he's a game designer and like knows his shit. <laughs> and it's like not a um, unless you work for like uh, a munitions manufacturer or something. And even then, depending on your situation, like it's not bad to take a job that like allows you to pay your rent. I work and this happens in theater all the time. Yeah, and I know so many artists who have jobs as like associate artistic directors or arts administrators who are also playwrights or also designers who leave their day job at the regional theater they work at um, and go rehearse their friend show at night. Yeah, I worked with a guy in a regional theater one time who was like a really cool actor and he played Zazu on Broadway in The Lion King for, God, I don't remember how long, but like eight years or something, mm -hmm. like a big stretch of time. And I was talking to him and it was like, yeah, there were some nights, you know, on the seventh or eighth show of the week where you'd go out there and the walls on the set would sort of start to close in on me. But then he told me, he was like, but, you know, my daughter, he was like, but my daughter was growing up. I was saving for like her education. And one time during the run, I broke my leg and I got like six weeks off with an amazing health package to like fully because he was doing a show for Disney and like they actually pay people. <laughs> yeah. So the takeaway is um, pay your artists. Pay people. Uh, yes. Just pay, pay, people. pay people, please. <laughs> Literally just pay people, please. And like stop dunking on things that you don't like because other people like them and that's okay unless they are actively doing harm. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like indie anything is not inherently better than anything else. It's all just a matter of what you like and what you're looking for out of the things that you consume. Yeah. Also, please pay people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exploiting people. It's not just for the big industrial <laughs> theaters anymore. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, on that note, thank you for listening to Dungeons and Drama Nerds. We'll see you again next week with more Apocalypse World Irremediably Home. Dungeons and Drama Nerds is produced by Todd Brian Backus. Percy Hornack and Nick Orvis, and is mixed and edited by Anthony Sertel Dean. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at DN Drama Nerds. Check out cast bios on our website, DungeonsAndDramaNerds.com, and tune in next week for another episode of Dungeons and Drama Nerds.